The vibrant chime of my phone echoed through the bedroom, jarring me from a restless slumber. I glanced at the clock, 3.14 a.m. An uneasy feeling settled in my gut as I reached for the device. Work emergencies at this hour were rare, but not unheard of in my line of business. My fingers froze as I caught a glimpse of the screen. It wasn't a work notification, it was a message from an unknown number. Curiosity peaked, I swiped to unlock the phone, and my world shattered. Can't wait to see you again, babe. That quickie in the supply closet was insane. The message was undoubtedly not meant for me, but the sender's identity was all too clear. Marissa, my cousin and supposed confidant, who had been staying with Derek and me to help during his recovery. Bile rose in my throat as I scrolled through the thread, each message more explicit than the last. The betrayal cut deeper with every lewd word, every suggestive emoji. Derek's affair with Marissa was laid bare before my eyes, the evidence irrefutable. I turned to face Derek's sleeping form, my vision blurred by unshed tears. How could he? How could they? Marissa was family, someone I had trusted implicitly. Yet there they were, carrying on a sordid affair right under my nose. Anger and hurt swirled within me, a tempestuous storm of emotions threatening to break loose. I longed to scream, to hurl accusations and demand answers, but the words stuck in my throat like shards of glass. Instead, I slipped out of bed, my movements robotic, and made my way to the living room. I collapsed onto the couch, clutching Derek's phone like a lifeline, its damning contents a stark reminder of the life I thought I knew crumbling around me. Hours ticked by, the first rays of dawn peeking through the curtains. I heard footsteps behind me, the telltale creak of the floorboards announcing Derek's presence. Elena, what are you doing up so early? He mumbled, his voice thick with sleep. I pivoted to face him, my jaw clenched, and held up the phone, the incriminating messages splayed across the screen. Care to explain this? Derek's expression morphed from confusion to panic in an instant. I, I can explain, he stammered, running a hand through his disheveled hair. Explain what exactly? I snapped, my voice trembling with barely contained fury. How you've been sleeping with my cousin right under my nose, how you've been betraying me with someone I trusted— he opened his mouth, but I cut him off, unwilling to hear his excuses. Save it, Derek. I don't want to hear your lies anymore. Anger and anguish welled up within me, threatening to spill over. I fought to maintain my composure, to cling to the last shreds of dignity I had left. Derek's lips pressed into a thin line, his eyes hardening. If you hadn't been so wrapped up in your work all the time, maybe this wouldn't have happened. His words sliced through me like a knife twisting the blade of betrayal deeper into my heart. In that moment, I knew our marriage was well and truly over. I rose from the couch, squaring my shoulders and meeting his gaze with unwavering resolve. Get out. Derek opened his mouth to protest, but I silenced him with a shake of my head. Just go, Derek. We're done. As he stormed out of the apartment, the weight of his betrayal finally hit me, and I sank to the floor, sobs racking my body. But amidst the pain and heartbreak, a newfound determination took root within me. They would pay for this. Both of them. In the days following Derek's explosive revelation, a fog of grief and disbelief enveloped me. I alternated between fits of rage and deep sorrow, grappling with the harsh reality of his betrayal. But as the initial shock subsided, a steely resolve took root. I would not be a victim. Not anymore. I confided in Alex, my closest friend and a brilliant lawyer. His jaw tightened as I recounted the sordid details, his normally jovial demeanor replaced by a cold fury. That lying, deceitful bastard, he seethed, slamming his fist on the table. We're gonna bury him, Elena. I promise you that. With Alex's guidance, I began meticulously gathering evidence of Derek's misdeeds, leaving no stone unturned. Late nights were spent combing through financial records, unearthing a trail of embezzlement and fraud that seemed to stretch back years. Derek had the audacity to confront me one evening as I pored over the damning documents. "'What are you up to, Elena?' he demanded, his eyes narrowed with suspicion. I met his gaze head-on, refusing to flinch. "'Funny, I was about to ask you the same thing, though I think I already know the answer.' He scoffed, his lips curling into a contemptuous sneer. "'You think you're so smart, don't you? Newsflash, sweetheart.' You're just a pretty face. Without me, your precious company would be nothing. White-hot rage coursed through my veins, but I reined it in, forcing a tight smile. 
We'll see about that, won't we? As the weeks passed, the web of deceit surrounding Derek and Marissa grew increasingly tangled. Marissa had not only been complicit in the affair, but had actively aided Derek in siphoning funds from my company. I summoned her to my office, the weight of the evidence heavy in my hands. She sauntered in, her expression a sickening mix of arrogance and feigned innocence. Elena, darling, what's this all about? She simpered, batting her eyelashes. I slapped the stack of papers onto the desk, my teeth clenched. Cut the act, Marissa. I know everything. The affair, the embezzlement. You two make me sick. Her facade crumbled replaced by a sneer that twisted her once-familiar features into an ugly mask. Oh, please, like you're some paragon of virtue. You were never around, always too busy with your precious company to pay attention to Derek. He needed someone who could actually satisfy him in more ways than one. The venom in her words stung, but I refused to let her see me flinch. You're both going to pay for what you've done, I vowed, my voice low and dangerous. Marissa threw back her head and laughed, a cruel, mocking sound. And how exactly do you plan to do that? Face it, Elena, you're powerless. Derek and I hold all the cards. I leaned forward, my gaze boring into hers with icy determination. We'll see about that. As she swept out of the office, I allowed myself a grim smile. They thought they had won, but they had no idea what was coming. With Alex's help, I would dismantle their lives piece by piece until they had nothing left but the consequences of their actions. The war had only just begun. In the wake of Marissa's taunting diatribe, a cold clarity washed over me. If I wanted to emerge victorious from this battle, I needed to arm myself to the teeth. Blind rage and impulsive actions would only play into Derek and Marissa's hands. No, I needed to be strategic, calculating, to fight fire with an inferno of my own making. I summoned Alex to my office, my expression grim. It's time we took the gloves off, I stated, sliding the damning evidence across the desk towards him. His brow furrowed as he skimmed the documents, a muscle twitching in his jaw. "'Son of a bitch has been bleeding your company dry for years,' he muttered, shaking his head in disbelief. "'Exactly, which is why we need to hit him where it hurts. His bank account.' I leaned forward, my gaze steely. "'I want you to freeze every asset, revoke all access to funds, the whole nine yards. Derek thinks money is power? Let's see how powerful he feels when he's broke and exposed as the fraud he is.' A feral grin spread across Alex's face. Consider it done. I'll have the paperwork filed first thing tomorrow morning. As Alex left to set the wheels in motion, I turned my attention to another crucial front, protecting my own assets. Derek and Marissa may have thought they held all the cards, but I wasn't about to make it easy for them. I summoned my finance team, my expression grave. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we have a situation on our hands. Over the next few hours, I worked tirelessly to transfer funds, liquidate investments, and batten down every financial hatch. By the time the sun rose the next morning, my assets were secured, safely out of Derek and Marissa's grubby paws. The first salvo had been fired. A few days later, Alex strode into my office, a triumphant gleam in his eye. It's done. Derek's assets have been frozen, and the authorities are investigating his financial dealings. Relief washed over me but I knew this was just the beginning. Derek would undoubtedly retaliate, and I had to be prepared. Sure enough, my phone rang later that evening, Derek's name flashing across the screen. I answered with a smirk, Hello, dear husband. His voice was a low snarl, barely contained fury simmering beneath the surface. What the hell did you do, Alina? My accounts are locked, my cards declined, everything's frozen. Oh, I'm sorry, did I fail to mention? I feigned innocence, unable to resist twisting the knife. I'm taking what's mine, Derek. Every last penny you stole from me, from my company, you and your little mistress are going to pay for what you've done. There was a beat of silence, and then he erupted, a torrent of vile profanities spewing forth. You conniving bitch! You think you've won, but you're dead wrong. This isn't over, not by a long shot. The line went dead, but his words only fueled my resolve. Let him rant and rave— I was holding all the cards now. With my assets secure and the law on my side, Derek and Marissa were nothing more than trapped rats, their world crumbling around them. I poured myself a glass of wine, allowing a self-satisfied smile to tug at my lips. The battle was far from over, but the tides had well and truly turned in my favor. They had started this war, 
but I was going to finish it, and emerge victorious, no matter what it took. With Derek's assets frozen and the authorities sniffing around his financial dealings, it was time to unleash the next phase of my counterattack. I knew Derek wouldn't go down without a fight, but I was prepared for all-out war. I strode into Alex's office, my jaw set with grim determination. It's time we brought out the big guns. Alex looked up from his desk, eyebrows raised. You know I live for dramatic flair, but I'm going to need a bit more context here. I want to file for divorce and hit Derek with every, every legal claim in the book. Fraud, embezzlement, conspiracy, the whole nine yards. My voice was steely, brooking no argument. A feral grin spread across Alex's face. Now you're speaking my language. I'll have the paperwork drawn up immediately. True to his word, Alex had the divorce papers ready within days, complete with a laundry list of charges that would make any self-respecting criminal's head spin. I signed them with a flourish, a sense of grim satisfaction washing over me. Derek's going to fight this tooth and nail, you know that, right? Alex cautioned, his expression serious. I met his gaze levelly. I'm counting on it. The moment the papers were filed, all hell broke loose. Derek's lawyer, a smarmy little weasel of a man, descended upon me like a rabid dog, hurling threats and accusations. This is a gross overreaction, Mrs. Davis, he sneered, his beady eyes narrowed with disdain. My client may have made some indiscretions, but this legal onslaught is completely unwarranted. I arched an eyebrow, unimpressed. Indiscretions? Is that what you call defrauding a company and cheating on your wife with her own cousin? The weasel's face reddened, but I pressed on, relentless. Your client is a lying, thieving scumbag, and he's going to pay for what he's done, in full. As the legal battle raged on, Derek and Marissa's sordid affair became public knowledge, splashed across every tabloid and gossip rag. Suddenly, the perfect couple everyone had envied was a punchline, a cautionary tale of greed and betrayal. Derek tried to maintain his usual bravado, sneering at reporters and issuing terse, no comments, but I could see the cracks in his facade, the way his smile didn't quite reach his eyes. Marissa, on the other hand, seemed to relish the attention, preening and posing for the cameras like a deranged socialite. That is, until the backlash from her own family hit. Her parents disowned her, her siblings cut off all contact, even her friends abandoned her, appalled by her despicable actions. As for me, I weathered the storm with my head held high, refusing to be cowed or shamed. Derek and Marissa had made their bed, and now they could lie in it, squirming under the harsh spotlight of public scrutiny. The courtroom battles were brutal, with both sides flinging allegations and personal attacks like grenades. But thanks to Alex's legal prowess and the mountain of evidence we'd amassed, we emerged victorious time and again. Finally, after months of bitter legal warfare, the knockout blow was delivered. Derek was not only forced to relinquish control of my company, but found himself facing criminal charges for fraud and embezzlement. As the judge read out the verdict, I allowed myself a satisfied smile. Derek caught my gaze, his eyes burning with impotent rage and hatred. But I didn't care. He was finished. His life in ruins. The war was over, and I had won. With Derek's assets frozen and the legal noose tightening around his neck, I expected him to slink away into the shadows, tail tucked between his legs. But the man was nothing if not a glutton for punishment. I'd barely savored my courtroom victory when my phone rang, Derek's name flashing across the screen. Against my better judgment, I answered, bracing myself for the inevitable torrent of vitriol. You think you've won, don't you? He spat, his voice dripping with venom. Well, you're sadly mistaken. This isn't over, not by a long shot. I rolled my eyes, utterly unfazed by his empty bravado. Save your breath, Derek. The courts have ruled, and you've been exposed as the lying, thieving scumbag you are. It's over. There was a pause, and I could practically hear the gears turning in his devious little mind. Maybe for me, he conceded, his tone taking on a sinister edge. But what about your precious company? You really think you're going to be able to run that ship without me? A knot of dread formed in the pit of my stomach, but I refused to show any outward signs of concern. I've been running this company just fine for years, Derek. You were nothing but a leech, draining its resources for your own gain. He barked out a harsh laugh. Keep telling yourself that, sweetheart. But the truth is you're in way over your head without me. Just you wait. 
your precious empire is going to come crashing down around you. The line went dead, but his words continued to echo in my mind, stoking the flames of doubt and uncertainty. Could he be right? Had I underestimated just how much control he'd wielded over the company's inner workings? I pushed the thoughts aside, refocusing my energy on securing my position and safeguarding the company from any further sabotage. With Derek's influence excised like a cancer, I set about purging his loyalists from key positions, replacing them with trusted allies. It wasn't long before the first bombshell hit. An anonymous whistleblower came forward, alleging that Derek had been cooking the books and falsifying financial reports for years. The news sent shockwaves through the company, triggering a mass exodus of investors and clients fleeing the perceived instability. I called an emergency meeting with my executive team, my expression grim. All right, people, we have a crisis on our hands. Derek's left us a lovely parting gift in the form of cooked books and shady dealings. Panic flickered across their faces, but I silenced it with a raised hand. But that ends today. From this moment on, we're going to scrub this company clean, leave no stone unturned. We're going to root out every last trace of Derek's corruption and rebuild from the ground up. There were murmurs of assent but one voice piped up from the back of the room. With all due respect, ma'am, how can we be sure you're not just as compromised as Derek was? The accusation hung in the air like a lead balloon, but I met it head on, unflinching. Because I'm not the one who betrayed this company for personal gain, I'm not the one who cheated and lied and stole, Derek did this, not me. I swept my gaze across the room, my expression resolute. I know I've got my work cut out for me in terms of regaining your trust, but I'm going to prove to each and every one of you that this company is in good hands, my hands. It was an uphill battle, but slowly, surely, I began to turn the tide. One by one, I won over the doubters, the skeptics, through sheer force of will and an unwavering commitment to transparency and integrity. As for Derek and Marissa, their fall from grace was as swift as it was brutal. With the legal walls closing in and their reputations in tatters, they found themselves social pariahs, shunned and ostracized by their former circles. I caught wind of Marissa's spectacular downfall. She'd been fired from her cushy marketing job, her severance package revoked in light of the scandal. Her family had disowned her, and her so-called friends had abandoned her, like rats fleeing a sinking ship. As for Derek, well, let's just say that his newfound status as a convicted felon didn't exactly open many doors in the business world. The once mighty titan had been reduced to a punchline, a cautionary tale of hubris and greed. And me? I stood at the helm of my company, battered but unbroken, a phoenix rising from the ashes of Derek's betrayal. The road ahead was long and arduous, but I was ready, ready to rebuild, to reclaim what was mine, and to emerge stronger than ever before. Derek and Marissa had tried to break me, but in the end they had only forged me into steel. In the aftermath of Derek's dramatic unraveling, a sense of grim satisfaction washed over me. The lying, cheating scumbag had finally received his comeuppance, his life in ruins, a fitting punishment for the devastation he'd wrought. But even as I savored my hard-won victory, a nagging sense of unease gnawed at me. Derek's final threat still echoed in my mind, a dark promise that my struggles were far from over. Sure enough, it wasn't long before the other shoe dropped. I was in the middle of a meeting with the marketing team, discussing strategies to rebuild our brand's tarnished image. When Alex burst through the door, his expression thunderous. Elena, we need to talk. Now. His tone brooked no argument. I excused myself, dread coiling in the pit of my stomach, and followed Alex to his office. He wasted no time in dropping the bombshell. Derek's filed a lawsuit against you and the company, he growled, slamming a thick stack of papers onto his desk. He's claiming you orchestrated a campaign of defamation and destroyed his career out of spite. White-hot fury surged through my veins as I scanned the documents. Are you kidding me? After everything that Snake did, the fraud, the embezzlement, the affair, he has the audacity to play the victim? Alex held up a placating hand. I know, I know, and trust me, this case is weaker than a wet paper bag, but it's still going to be a massive headache, not to mention a PR nightmare. I gritted my teeth, stealing my resolve. So be it. We'll fight this like we've fought everything else Derek's thrown our way. With the truth on our side. 
The ensuing legal battle was nothing short of a circus, a spectacle of mudslinging and personal attacks that played out in the public eye. Derek's lawyers painted him as a tragic figure, a devoted family man, driven to desperate measures by a cold, neglectful wife. I scoffed at the absurd notion, but the accusations stung nonetheless. How dare he try to twist the narrative to rewrite history and absolve himself of his own despicable actions? In the end, though, facts proved far more potent than fiction. With the mountain of evidence we'd amassed, financial records, witness testimonies, even Derek's own incriminating messages, his flimsy case crumbled like a house of cards. The final nail in the coffin came when Marissa took the stand. Faced with the prospect of perjury charges, she sang like a canary, spilling every sordid detail of her affair with Derek and their conspiracy to defraud my company. I'll never forget the look on Derek's face as Marissa delivered her damning testimony, his mask of righteous indignation melting away to reveal the sniveling coward beneath. In that moment, he knew he was beaten, his last desperate gambit thwarted. When the verdict finally came down, it was a resounding victory for our side. Derek's lawsuit was dismissed, and he was ordered to pay exorbitant legal fees and damages. But that wasn't the end of his humiliation. As I left the courthouse, flanked by Alex and a throng of reporters, Derek emerged from the building, his head hung in defeat. Our eyes met, and I saw a flicker of pure, unadulterated hatred burning in his gaze. "'You won't get away with this,' he snarled, his voice dripping with venom. "'I'll make sure you pay for what you've done, even if it's the last thing I do.' A mirthless chuckle escaped my lips as I regarded the pathetic shell of a man before me. You're the one who's going to pay, Derek, for the rest of your miserable life. With that, I turned on my heel and strode away, leaving him to stew in the wreckage of his own making. The war was over, and I had emerged victorious, but at what cost? As the celebrations died down and the dust settled, I found myself alone in my office, staring out at the city skyline. What should have been a moment of triumph felt hollow somehow, tainted by the bitter aftertaste of revenge. Had it all been worth it? The lies, the deception, the scorched earth tactics? Or had I lost a piece of myself along the way, sacrificed on the altar of vindication? A quiet voice in the back of my mind whispered that perhaps there was another way, a path that didn't involve sinking to Derek's level of depravity. But it was too late for such musings now. The die had been cast, and there was no going back. All I could do was soldier on, rebuild what had been broken, and pray that the hollow ache in my chest would eventually fade. Derek and Marissa had been vanquished, but at what price? Only time would tell if the cost of my vengeance was one I could truly stomach. In the weeks following my courtroom triumph over Derek's petty lawsuit, an uneasy truce settled over the battlefield. The war may have been won, but the scars ran deep. For both sides, I threw myself into the task of rebuilding, working tirelessly to restore my company's tarnished reputation and repair the damage wrought by Derek's deception. With each small victory, a new client, a positive press mention, a rising stock price, the hollow ache in my chest began to fade, replaced by a newfound sense of purpose. Derek, on the other hand, had well and truly fallen from grace. His once glittering career lay in ruins, the mighty titan reduced to a cautionary tale. I caught wind of his sordid downfall through the grapevine. No reputable firm would touch him, his reputation forever tainted by his criminal convictions. As for Marissa, well, let's just say karma has a way of evening the scales. It was a crisp autumn morning when Alex strode into my office, a triumphant gleam in his eye. You'll never guess what fresh hell our favorite dysfunctional duo has landed themselves in, he announced, settling into the chair opposite my desk. I arched an eyebrow equal parts intrigued and wary. Do I even want to know? Alex's grin widened as he slid a folder across the desk. See for yourself. I flipped it open, my eyes widening as I scanned the contents. You can't be serious. As a heart attack, Alex confirmed. Derek and Marissa are being charged with conspiracy to commit fraud, racketeering, you name it. Seems our little whistleblower friend was just the tip of the iceberg. A bitter chuckle escaped my lips as I digested the news. I never thought I'd see the day. Well, believe it, sister, Alex crowed. Those two snakes are finally getting the book thrown at them. Hard. In the days that followed, the sordid details of Derek and Marissa's far-reaching criminal enterprise trickled out, 
each revelation more shocking than the last. They'd been living a double life, using my company as a front to funnel illicit funds, evade taxes, and line their own pockets. The evidence was damning, overwhelming, and this time there was no wiggle room, no legal loopholes for Derek's team of shysters to exploit. He and Marissa were well and truly boxed in, the walls closing in around them. I'll never forget the day they were led into the courtroom in handcuffs, a pathetic sight to behold. Derek, once so poised and confident, hung his head in shame, his expensive suit rumpled and disheveled. Marissa, for her part, maintained a haughty air of defiance, but I could see the fear flickering in her eyes. The trial was little more than a formality, a public crucifixion to lay bare their myriad sins. Witness after witness took the stand, each more damaging than the last, until the weight of their guilt became too massive to deny. When the verdict finally came down, guilty on all counts, a weight lifted from my shoulders. It was over, truly and finally over. Derek and Marissa's twisted game of deceit and betrayal had been blown wide open, their misdeeds exposed for the world to see. As they were led away in chains, Marissa caught my eye, her gaze burning with impotent rage. In that moment, I felt something I hadn't expected. Pity. Here were two souls so consumed by greed and hubris that they'd sacrificed everything, their reputations, their freedom, their very souls. Derek, on the other hand, refused to meet my gaze, his eyes downcast in bitter resignation. The mighty had well and truly fallen, brought low by his own avarice and depravity. In the aftermath, as the dust settled and the media circus died down, I found myself standing atop the rubble of our once idyllic lives, a victor surveying the hard-won battlefield. It was finally over. But as I looked out over the smoldering wreckage, I couldn't help but wonder, at what cost had this victory come? What parts of myself had I sacrificed in pursuit of vengeance? And was it all truly worth it in the end? Only time would tell, I supposed, as I turned my back on the past and strode forward into an uncertain future. The war was won, but the scars would linger. In the months following Derek and Marissa's dramatic downfall, an uneasy calm settled over my life. The storm had finally passed, leaving behind a strange, unsettling calm in its wake. With the legal battles and PR firestorms firmly in the rearview mirror, I found myself adrift, unmoored from the singular purpose that had driven me for so long. Vengeance had been my guiding star, my reason for breathing, and now that it had been achieved, I felt oddly hollow, untethered. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the immediate aftermath of Derek and Marissa's sentencing, a wave of relief washed over me. The nightmare was finally over, the demons that had haunted me for so long vanquished. I could breathe again, live again, free from the weight of their betrayal or so I thought. The first few weeks passed in a blur of celebration and congratulations. Alex threw a raucous party at his place, a veritable who's who of the city's legal elite in attendance, all eager to toast the downfall of the dastardly duo. I plastered on a smile and made the rounds, accepting drinks and backslaps with practiced grace. But underneath the veneer of polite socialization, a part of me felt off, out of place, like an interloper at my own victory party. As the weeks stretched into months, that sense of disconnection only deepened. Logically, I knew I should have been over the moon. I'd not only survived Derek's betrayal but emerged victorious, my reputation and company intact. But the nagging feeling persisted. Like a tiny voice whispering in the back of my mind, was it really a victory if it had cost me a piece of my soul? I tried to lose myself in work, throwing every ounce of my energy into rebuilding my company's battered public image. New initiatives were launched, charitable foundations established, all in the name of scrubbing the stain left by Derek's misdeeds. And yet, no matter how many 16-hour days I pulled, how many millions I funneled into good PR, that empty ache lingered, a constant companion I couldn't seem to shake. It all came to a head one night as I sat alone in my office, staring out at the city skyline. A half-empty bottle of scotch sat on my desk, the amber liquid swirling in the glass clutched in my hand. A soft rap at the door roused me from my reverie. Come in, I called out, not bothering to turn around. Working late again, I see. Alex's familiar drawl reached my ears as he settled into the chair opposite my desk. You know, they make these newfangled things called vacations these days might want to look into one. 
I huffed out a mirthless chuckle, swirling the contents of my glass. You know me, Alex. No rest for the wicked and all that. He was silent for a beat, studying me with those perceptive eyes of his. You don't seem terribly celebratory for someone who just took down public enemy number one. I sighed, finally meeting his gaze. I don't know, Alex. I should be over the moon, right? Derek and Marissa are behind bars, my company's back on track. But— I trailed off, struggling to put the gnawing disquiet into words. But something's still eating at you, he finished, giving me a knowing look. You got your revenge, Elena. The question is, was it worth it? His words hung in the air, heavy and laden with implication. Was it worth it? The lies, the deception, the scorched earth campaign that had nearly consumed me? In that moment, the weight of everything I'd sacrificed in pursuit of vengeance came crashing down around me. The person I'd allowed myself to become, the moral lines I'd crossed, had it truly been a fair trade for seeing Derek punished? The bitter taste of self-loathing flooded my mouth, and I slammed my glass down with a trembling hand. No, no, it wasn't worth it. The admission hung between us, raw and painful. After a long, weighty silence, Alex spoke up his voice uncharacteristically gentle. Then it's time to leave the past in the past, my friend. Time to start over, to become the person you want to be, not the one forged in the fires of revenge. His words rang true, a clarion call amidst the storm of self-doubt that had consumed me for so long. It was time, time to let go, to shed the burdens of the past and step into the light. A fragile smile tugged at my lips as I met Alex's gaze the first sparks of hope flickering to life in my chest. "'You're right,' I whispered, the weight already beginning to lift from my shoulders. "'It's time for a new beginning. The road ahead would be long, fraught with challenges and inner demons to conquer, but for the first time in longer than I could remember, I felt a sense of purpose unclouded by rage or thirst for retribution. It was time to be reborn, to rise like a phoenix from the ashes of my own making.' Derek and Marissa's betrayal may have broken me once, but I was determined to emerge from the crucible stronger, wiser, my soul intact. A new chapter was beginning, and this time, the pen was firmly in my own hand. My name is Darcy. I live in a house with my husband, Carlos, and our daughter, Nikki. Carlos and I met in college and became close friends. I studied design, and he studied law. We both joined the same club. After college, I got a job at a design firm, which I really enjoyed. Carlos and I dated for a while, then got married when we were in our early 20s. When I got pregnant with Nikki, I kept working until she was born. But after she arrived, I decided to stay home and take care of her. Carlos and others thought it was a good idea for me to focus on being a mom, so I started working from home. Carlos became a lawyer after passing the bar exam. One day, Nikki said, Mommy, I'm going to play with my friends. I'll be back before it gets dark, okay? Life is really great living with my husband and daughter, and doing work I love. But one day, something surprising happened. I was out shopping, quite far from home, when I saw my mother-in-law, Christine, struggling with some heavy bags. I decided to go over to her. Hi, mother-in-law. Oh, Darcy, what a surprise. Christine said with a warm smile. It had been a while since we last saw each other so I was happy to see her and suggested, how about we have some tea together? I'd love to, but I'm in a rush, she replied. Oh, I understand. No worries. Let's plan to catch up over tea next time. But let me help you with these bags at least. They look really heavy, I offered. After a bit of convincing, I managed to load her bags into the back seat of my car. They were quite heavy, and carrying two of them would have been a challenge. Thank you and sorry, Christine said with a smile. It made me feel better that being a bit assertive was okay. Plus, there was something I wanted to talk to her about. As we drove to her home, we chatted about various things. Since it takes about three hours and thirty minutes to get to our in-laws' place, we can't visit often. But we always make sure to visit for New Year celebrations so I know the way well. Wasn't it hard for you to carry all of this by yourself? I asked, finally bringing up something that had been on my mind. During the drive, I noticed that one of the bags my mother-in-law was carrying had groceries, while the other had daily essentials and cosmetic items that seemed more suited for a younger person rather than her usual style. Well, they're just things I needed. I ended up getting quite a bit, she said, looking a bit down. 
I didn't push for more information and continued driving us to her home. Darcy, thank you so much for your help. You've been a lifesaver. You can drop me off here. I'll manage to take them from the entrance, Christine said gratefully. You don't have to do that, I replied. As my mother-in-law opened the door, I placed the bags by the entrance. Suddenly, a sharp voice cut through the air. About time you got back, mother-in-law, said my sister-in-law, Katie. She seemed taken aback to see me and her words faltered. I was equally surprised to see Katie, and I found myself unable to move. My mother-in-law looked flustered as she tried to gauge the situation. Hey Katie, it's been a while. How have you been? I said, attempting to ease the tension. Ah, yeah, it's been a bit, Katie replied. I returned her smile and observed her closely. She seemed a bit disheveled, like she had just woken up. Holding her phone, she appeared a bit distracted. Her interrupted sentence left me feeling a bit suspicious. I'm sorry for dropping in unexpectedly. I saw mother-in-law struggling with the bags while I was shopping nearby. So I decided to help out, I explained. I see. I just got back from work this morning. I'm a bit of a mess. Sorry about that. Thanks for helping, mother-in-law. I'll take it from here, Katie said hastily, grabbing the bags and heading inside. In a gentle tone, I asked my mother-in-law, is everything okay living with Katie and the family? She simply smiled and nodded. Thank you for asking, Darcy. I'm doing fine. I'm sorry I can't offer you tea. Don't worry about it. It was nice catching up. I'll come visit again. I reassured her, deciding not to push further. But I couldn't shake off the feeling about what I had just seen. Originally, my mother-in-law was supposed to live with us. But after my father-in-law passed away over a decade ago, my brother-in-law, Brett, had said, We'll stay in the family home and take care of mom. Even Carlos, my husband, had been concerned at first. I felt uneasy about the situation, so I decided to bring it up, but it didn't go well. Carlos is really busy with work, isn't he? And his days off are unpredictable. I work nearby, and Katie's parents are close too, but still, my mother-in-law reassured me. Don't worry, I caused a lot of trouble when I was younger, and I haven't done much for mom. I want to repay her. Okay, considering what was said, Carlos couldn't really argue. So with my mother-in-law's agreement, my brother-in-law and his wife ended up moving into her house. Today, I talked to Carlos about what happened. Really? That's concerning. I'm a bit worried now. Maybe we should give Brett a call. Carlos suggested, sensing my unease. After listening to my concerns, Carlos decided to call Brett. Hey, Brett, it's Carlos. How's everything going? Carlos greeted him. Hey, Carlos, everything's good, Brett replied. After some small talk, Carlos steered the conversation toward the topic at hand. These calls usually ended up with Brett talking about how great things were between him and Katie, and this one was no different. Glad to hear things are going well for you, Carlos said politely. Yeah, we're planning an extended vacation next week. Is mom coming along? Brett inquired. Um, well, mom actually said it's fine if it's just the two of us, Carlos responded. Carlos and I exchanged glances. It wasn't unexpected considering my mother-in-law's nature, but we did notice Brett pause for a moment. In that case, why don't we have mom stay with us while you're away? Carlos proposed. What? Brett sounded surprised at Carlos's suggestion. I glanced at Carlos, who gave me a reassuring smile before continuing. We haven't seen mom in a while, and I think Nikki will be thrilled. I'll reach out to mom. So it's settled, Carlos stated firmly. Hey, hold on. Carlos interrupted before Brett could respond further. He took a deep breath, his expression serious as he looked at me. This was a chance for us to delve deeper into the situation with my mother-in-law. After that, Carlos quickly finalized the arrangements with Brett. I coordinated with my mother-in-law, and she agreed to stay with us for about a week. Granny's coming today, Nikki exclaimed excitedly. Yes, it's going to be fun, I replied. Nikki adores her grandmother so she was thrilled about her visit. A few days later, my mother-in-law arrived with only a few belongings. As soon as she stepped in, she seemed relieved and bowed her head. I'm sorry for imposing for a whole week, she said. No need to apologize. We're glad to have you here. Nikki has been looking forward to it, so please make yourself comfortable, I reassured her. And so we spent a week together with my mother-in-law. However, 
I couldn't shake off the unease I felt about her behavior from the very beginning. Before her arrival, I had cleaned up the home office I usually work in to make space for her. When I showed her the room, she immediately said, Oh, you've set up such a nice room for me. I feel guilty. I'd be fine with just a corner. Don't worry about it. Please feel free to use the room. I only use it for work anyway. I insisted, but she still seemed apologetic. With the kids off school, I had planned to make lunch for the three of us when my mother-in-law surprised me by saying, Let me cook. Can I use the fridge? Despite my insistence that she should relax, she kept insisting on doing household chores. Eventually, I managed to convince her to unwind in the living room while Nikki kept her company. Throughout the day, she would make comments like, Oh, don't trouble yourself with snacks for me. I'm not worth it. Or, I'm fine with whatever leftovers there are. Cold food is enough for me, as if she was an outsider rather than family. It was hard to see her belittling herself like this when she used to be much more lively. When Carlos came home and saw my mother-in-law chatting with Nikki, I filled him in on her behavior. I understand. Thanks for telling me. I wish she would see her own worth more. Let's keep an eye on her. It's only the first day, right? As it got late and we were getting ready for bed, my mother-in-law surprised us again by saying, I guess I'll use this spot for a bit, referring to the basement floor as a place to sleep. Mom, Carlos was speechless. I calmly said, Mother-in-law, please consider this your room until you leave. Use a blanket so you stay warm. But won't that be a bother? She asked. Absolutely not. We want you to feel comfortable and enjoy your time here. I said earnestly, looking her straight in the eye. Her behavior hinted at the kind of life she'd been living with her own family. When I smiled warmly at her, my mother-in-law's eyes welled up with tears, and she finally broke down. It's been ten years since I've slept in such a warm place. Thank you. The revelation hit me hard, and Carlos's voice dropped several notches, filled with disbelief. Mom, tell us the truth. Are things okay with Brett and the others? How's life really been? My mother-in-law let out a nervous chuckle before answering. Well, booking might be pushing it, but I have to manage, right? I mean, if they kicked me out, I wouldn't know what to do at my age. Slowly, she started to open up about the harsh reality of her life. It was far worse than we had imagined. She was doing all the housework in that house, whenever Katie wasn't happy. She'd get yelled at. All the shopping duties fell on my mother-in-law's shoulders. She was even covering most of the living expenses. It became clear that her son-in-law and his wife had ulterior motives when they suggested living together, mainly to exploit my mother-in-law's finances. My mother-in-law would only eat after Brett and Katie were done, usually in the unheated basement, leaving her freezing during the winter months. It's been a while since I've had a meal like today, she confessed tearfully. I've always been alone, you know, she revealed. What? Are you serious? I was shocked by her revelation. It turned out that my mother-in-law wanted to sleep in the basement because it had become the norm for her in her previous home. Carlos and I were speechless. Initially, when Brett and Katie moved in, they were kind to her. At first, my mother-in-law was happy and thought it was a good idea to live with them. However, as the years passed, their behavior changed drastically. In the beginning, Katie used to cook and Brett would help with other chores. I'm so tired, Brett. You work so hard. Let me take care of things today. You should rest, Katie would say. Really? Thanks, Mom, Rhett would reply. That was probably the beginning. I'm really tired today, my mother-in-law would say. Oh, sorry, Katie. I have plans with the neighbors today, Katie would reply. What? You're prioritizing them over me, Katie would retort. Oh, I apologize. That's selfish of me, my mother-in-law would say. No, that's not it. Don't worry. I'll prepare dinner when I get back, Katie would assure her. This is my room, and this is Brett's room, my mother-in-law would assert. Gradually, Brett and Katie started to manipulate and exploit my mother-in-law more and more. Eventually, she found herself shouldering almost all of the household chores and contributing financially as well. At first, my mother-in-law used what used to be my father-in-law's study as her room. It was a well-equipped space with a bed and other furnishings, and she was happy to have such a cherished space as her own. However, even the study wasn't safe from Katie's interference. One day, Katie suggested, let's renovate this old study. Hold on, Katie, this was my husband's beloved study. Can we please leave it as it is? My mother-in-law pleaded. I'm just thinking about your comfort, 
Katie would insist. Why are you making me out to be the bad guy? My mother-in-law would question. I'm sorry, but I prefer it the way it is, really, she would say. This room is outdated. It's worthless with all this junk, Katie would argue. Then, intentionally, Katie reached for a piece of glasswork, a music box made of glass, a favorite of my late father-in-law. He bought it during a trip they took together, and it held sentimental value. But Katie deliberately dropped it. Oops, my mistake. I didn't mean to, Katie would say. Oh no, the glass is shattered everywhere. It's so dangerous. What a shame to keep this room the same, especially with all this junk. Please don't touch anything else, my mother-in-law would plead. Who do you think you're talking to? Fine. I'll leave the study alone. But from now on, you handle everything in the house. And with all this junk, it's too risky for you to sleep here. You should sleep in the basement. Any objections? Katie would demand. In the end, my mother-in-law reluctantly agreed and had to sleep in the basement. I felt like I was going to faint hearing all these shocking stories. At the same time, I was furious with myself for not noticing sooner. I'm so sorry, Mom. How did I not see any of this? I asked, feeling guilty. Don't blame yourself. I was hiding it, too. Isn't it awful? My mother-in-law replied sadly. The reason we never noticed was also because of a scheme by my brother-in-law and his wife. They only gave my mother-in-law a room when relatives visited, but it was empty, no bed, no furniture, and if she dared to speak up, they threatened to destroy her study. They only acted nice when other people were around. We didn't see what was happening because of that. If my mother-in-law and I hadn't bumped into each other that day, this might have continued even longer. The thought sent chills down my spine. I always wanted to talk to you about this, but that study— and that house are full of memories with my husband. My mother-in-law said tearfully. Tears streamed down her face, and I couldn't hold back my own. Our dear mother-in-law had endured this for over a decade. I couldn't even imagine how hard it must have been for her. How could her own family do this? They're heartless. I exclaimed, pulling her into a tight hug. Darcy, I need to step out for a moment, my mother-in-law said, her voice trembling with emotion. After we cried together, Carlos gently rubbed my back and spoke softly. Don't worry, Darcy and Mom. I'll take care of this. Please look after Mom, Darcy. I nodded silently. Got it. Leave Mom to me, Carlos. I hugged our worried mother-in-law again, soothing her with gentle strokes on her back. Then I turned to Carlos and said firmly, Go teach those awful people a lesson. Absolutely, Carlos chuckled and nodded, then left the house. Later he called to say he wouldn't be back until tomorrow evening. I shared the news with my mother-in-law, and we all drank warm milk, trying to lift the mood with some good stories. Nikki, who had heard the commotion, looked concerned and joined us. I wanted to replace at least some of the bad memories. Usually, I'd remind Nikki not to stay up late, but since tomorrow was a day off, the three of us enjoyed chatting until we were content. All right, that's enough for today, mother-in-law. How about joining us for some chopping tomorrow? We can buy whatever you want and eat delicious food. There's a cute dessert place that Nikki loves. Let's have a relaxing day, just the three of us, I suggested. At my words, my mother-in-law's eyes filled with tears again. She nodded slowly, repeating thank you, thank you over and over. That night, we set up an air mattress in the living room and slept closely together, with my mother-in-law in the middle. The next morning, she greeted us with the same smile she used to have when my father-in-law was alive. Good morning, she exclaimed. And just as promised, we all had a fun shopping day. In the evening, we received a message from Carlos saying he had returned home. So we headed back as well. Before going inside, I had one more thing to say to my mother-in-law. Mother-in-law, we're on your side. Whatever is hurting you, feel free to share it with us. We'll always be here for you and I'm on Granny's side too. I reassured her. She nodded silently in response. Welcome home. Sorry for leaving the house to you. Carlos greeted us with a warm smile. We're back. Everything okay? I asked. Yeah, no issues here, Carlos replied. I had Nikki and my mother-in-law wait in my home office while I walked into the living room. My eyes widened when I saw my brother-in-law and his wife sitting on the floor, their hands trembling slightly on their knees. They greeted me in a soft voice, their faces filled with apprehension. What? What's going on? My confusion was evident on my face as I turned to Carlos. 
Still smiling, he said, I haven't taken any action yet. His use of yet made me tense up, anticipating something significant. To get straight to the point, starting today, Mom will be living with us, Carlos announced. I felt relieved to hear those words. Carlos continued speaking, and as he did, I nodded in agreement. So, Brett, do you fully understand the impact of your actions on Mom? And you too, Katie, do you realize what you've put someone else's mother through in her own home? I can't say it's entirely your fault. We didn't notice it either. But you need to take responsibility for your actions. After all, you're supposed to be mature adults, Carlos spoke passionately. It was the first time I had seen the usually gentle and calm Carlos so angry. I usually prefer not to bring work matters into our home. But this time, I'm speaking as Miss Christine's attorney, not just as family, Carlos continued. His tone was firm but controlled. My brother-in-law and his wife responded meekly, yes. After several hours of discussion, several decisions were reached. Firstly, my brother-in-law and his wife would no longer be living with us. They were required to return all the money they had taken from my mother-in-law, along with additional compensation. In consideration of my mother-in-law's emotional attachment to her study and her own home, my brother-in-law and his wife agreed to move out. We forbade them from ever entering my mother-in-law's home again. Upon hearing the decision, my mother-in-law gave a troubled smile. So we're still family, right? Asking for compensation seems a bit extreme, don't you think, she said. Carlos's words caused Brett to nod so vigorously that it looked as though his head might fall off. Yes, yes, I'm truly sorry for everything. Please accept this as our apology, Brett said, looking thoroughly remorseful. After the discussion, Carlos took a deep breath and addressed my mother-in-law. So please accept this, Mom. Let's put this behind us. Brett and his wife will never forget what they've done and will ensure it never happens again, Carlos said gently. They both nodded in silence. Seeing this, Carlos smiled softly and continued in a quiet voice. It won't happen again, right? They both responded, yes, yes, never again, absolutely. So the conversation came to an end. Within a few months, we received the compensation that Carlos had arranged for my brother-in-law and his wife. My mother-in-law wanted to give it to us, saying it was because we had helped her. But we refused. She insisted, so we agreed to accept a small amount each month for groceries and let her use the rest. Carlos, what did you say to Brett and his wife? I was curious about that day, so I asked him when we were alone. I said to Carlos. Carlos scratched his head, even though it wasn't itchy. Don't worry about me losing my cool, okay? Why would I? You stood up for your mom, and they regretted what they did. I replied. Actually, Carlos had contacted Brett immediately after hearing what had happened. It's rare for me to get angry, but when I do, people say I'm pretty intimidating. I think I really scared them when I called, Carlos said. He told me where he was right away. Although a bit distant, he drove straight to the destination. Upon arriving, he'd immediately confronted the two. I couldn't just let it slide, especially because he's my brother, and I trusted him with mom. I didn't know all the details. But judging by how scared they both looked, Carlos must have been really intimidating when he was angry, I thought. As they left, they bowed deeply, saying, We're truly sorry. Well, mother-in-law seems happy, and so does Nikki. I'm happy too. Thank you for standing up for us, Carlos. I'll keep doing my best for our family, even after everything. It's reassuring to know we can still be a happy family. I said, grateful for my reliable husband and for my mother-in-law who chose to lean on us. From now on, I'm determined to make up for the hardships by being a devoted daughter-in-law and doing my best in every way.